Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, One World Optimization Seminar team first uh, for running the very nice online seminar and now for bringing us together in person here. Really uh, very nice. Um, so this is joint work. So is there a pointer? No. Uh, yeah, he's switched off. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is joint work with Johannes Mills, who did his PhD in my group, and now he is an um, assistant professor at Georgia Tech. Um, we will consider sample size estimates, which are non-asymptotic, in a non-convex PDE-constrained context uh, for optimization under uncertainty. Most of the time, the PDE will be hidden, so essentially we have an infinite dimensional uh, 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 a stochastic optimization problem that uh, enjoys a certain structure that we can use. Um, we will use the optimality conditions based on the normal map to uncover some uh, more or less hidden uh, um, uh, compactness. Namely, we will be able to show that the SAA optimal controls uh, are bounded in H1, which is a space that is compactly embedded in our control space L2. And this compactness then can be used to use uh, covering numbers for getting uh, sample size estimates. Um, if time permits, I will show some numerical illustrations at the end. Uh, we have a recent paper on this in PSYOPS. Um, let me first uh, go through quickly through two slides on available results on sample size estimates. Um, there is uh, the convex world where one has uh, uh, results uh, and uh, there one can use different techniques than uh, we will use. For instance, one then can use monotonicity of the gradient uh, to get estimates. Um, but in our setting, we will be non-convex, and uh, there most of the available results are in finite dimensions, and the common scheme is that one assumes that the feasible set is uh, compact. And we will not have this, but we will then get, uh, um, we will get compactness uh, from uh, optimality conditions. Uh, now, in, uh, on an abstract level, the problem we look at is of this form. So here, the state of the um, PDE enters. U is the control. Xi is a random input into the PDE, which I have written here in abstract form. And uh, the structure is such that given a control U and uh, an, a realization of the random input Xi, there exists a unique uh, state Y. And uh, this then induces an operator mapping u and xi to the corresponding state, and I call this S. And uh, well, here, this is a typical cost function in PDE constraint optimization. One wants to control the PDE such that the corresponding state matches as good as possible a desired state. And since uh, the state is a random variable because we have this random input. Uh, we use here the simplest way of making this deterministic, applying the expectation. Uh, further steps would then be to use more advanced uh, risk measures. Then uh, also typical for optimal control, we have here an L2 regularization, U is the control. And here this is a, a further regularization term uh, where we can enforce structure uh, and the psi is convex, proper, closed, and extended real values. So it could encode also control constraints. Um, yes, yeah, so I think this is uh, all we need to know for the moment. Our state space is the Sobolev space H1, and for simplicity, we assume zero boundary conditions. Uh, our PDE and uh, control and state live on a d-dimensional bounded domain, capital D. Okay, and we now look at uh, the most commonly used uh, approximation scheme for the expectation in this problem, and this is sample average approximation, just the Monte Carlo approach. 
And then, of course, the question arises, if we compute solutions to this uh, SAA problem, how good are they in expectation or with a certain probability solutions to this one? And since we have a nonlinear PDE, the S is uh, nonlinear, therefore this part of the cost function is non-convex, and therefore we will be satisfied with first-order critical points. So we are interested if we have a first-order critical point, how well does it approximate a first-order critical point of the above? Um, okay, so this is uh, the uh, uh, objective today. Uh, the, the challenges are that we have a lack of compactness. Uh, we will assume that the Psi has a bounded domain. So we, the, the controls, the feasible controls then live in a bounded set in L2, but since, uh, but this is not, uh, in general, not compact in L2 because we are in infinite dimensions. So we have a lack of compactness and, well, we have non-convexity. Okay, so somehow we need to find some compactness to move on, and uh, this can be done as follows. So let's call the state-dependent part of the cost function J. So this is what is sitting inside of the expectation. Now it's not difficult if one analyzes the, the PDE and the adjoint PDE and uses the adjoint representation of this uh, gradient of J. Then one can show that this gradient is, under our assumptions on the data, uniformly bounded in the space H1. So since J maps U in L2 to R, the gradient would be an L2 function on the domain B. Uh, so one would only expect L2 bounds, but we can show via uh, 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 the structure of the PDE that actually this L2 function here is bounded in H1. And this means, so uh, bounded sets in H1 are compact sets in L2. So this gives us some, some compactness. But for the moment only for this gradient, we would like to have uh, compactness in this control space. So we have some somehow to translate it to you. Um, okay, and uh, for this we use the normal map, which was introduced by Steve Robinson. Um, and I recap some properties of the normal map. For our problem, if we introduce the state-dependent part of the cost function as capital F and the sample average approximation by Fn, then for our problem, the normal map looks like this. So this for the original problem, this for the SAA. Uh, and uh, now I will discuss this normal, normal map and how it is related to first order optimality. So if a vector V, which also lives in L2, is a zero of the normal map, then we can introduce U like this. So we just call what's sitting inside of the grad F, U, and then U turns out to be a first order optimal point of uh, our uh, optimization problem. And so uh, this is just if one uses the prox of the non-smooth part of the cost function to formulate the first order optimality condition, this comes out. If psi would be the zero function, then the prox would be the identity, and then this is just uh, uh, one over alpha times the gradient of the, of the cost function. Okay, so therefore, uh, if we have a zero of the normal map, we can compute the corresponding first order uh, critical point of our problem. Conversely, if we have a first order critical point u, we can compute a V from this formula to get a zero of the normal map. Therefore, we can go back and forth between uh, uh, critical points of the PDE and vectors V that are zeros of the normal map. And for us, it, would, it will be more convenient to work with the normal map version of optimality conditions than uh, with uh, these more direct ones. And I discussed phi, but we can do exactly the same for the SAA problem and the corresponding normal map. Okay, now um, 
we want to use this to show that our optimal controls live in a compact set. So let's look, uh, we, we, uh, we just noted, uh, so we look at the sample average approximation. Now we saw on the previous slide that if we have a critical point of the SAA problem, we can express this via a zero of the corresponding normal map, which then is a VN bar. We had a formula to compute VN bar from UN bar, and we had this formula to compute UN bar from VN bar. Okay, and the normal map equation uh, written in detail looks like this. Okay, and now I want to derive from this that the VN bars are bounded in the space H1. Uh, this is not difficult because this gradient here is a, um, is a mean of gradients of J, and on the previous slide we had an H1 bound on these gradients. This was upper bounded by R, then the mean is also upper bounded by R, okay? Therefore, this gradient is upper bounded by R in H1, and then this gives us easily that the H1 norm of this is at most one over alpha times the upper bound on this gradient. Therefore, we have this inclusion. So we see with probability one, so independently on how we choose the samples in our SAA approximation, the SAA solution or its normal map version of it uh, lives in this uh, H1, uh, bounded H1 set and therefore in a compact set in L2. And this brings us in business to, to do sample uh, uh, size estimates. Okay, and now the pattern of how one can do this is as follows. So this is the only technical uh, slide I have. So we have um, a VN bar that corresponds to a first order optimal point of our sample average approximation. Now this gives us how first order optimal this is for our uh, original problem. So we want to, to have some epsilon bound on this. So therefore we want to upper bound this. So, and we do this as follows. First, we shift in this zero. Vn bar is a zero of phi n. And then the tr uh, to proceed, the trouble is that the SAA solution depends on the sample, and therefore it's a random variable. So we do not know, where, uh, this is not a fixed point. It changes from uh, uh, realization to realization. But we had on the previous slide that all these Vn bars live in this set. So we can upper bound this by a supremum over this set. Okay, so this is the technique one uses here. Now, if we fix a point from this set and look at uh, this argument of the soup, then uh, we can uh, proceed. Uh, so the difficulty here is that this is the soup over, uh, uh, well, uh, um, a continuum of Vs. Uh, we want to make this soup over finitely many elements, and for this we can use a covering. So let's assume this set can be covered by Vks uh, with fineness nu. So this means for any V in this uh, set, we find a Vk that is nu close to V. Okay, now instead of working with V here, we take the closest point in the covering and then via triangle inequalities, we have to correct this. Um, but the arguments of these phi n and phi are new in distance. And in our setting, we will be able to show that these two functions, the normal maps are Lipschitz. So we can estimate these two terms by Lipschitz constant times distance of V to the closest covering point. This gives us this term, and this one is just the one from above. Um, and what remains is to estimate this term. Okay, um, now let's bring some uh, abstraction into this. So what remains is, uh, so we started here, we had the soup, then we had this. Now the soup over this then is less than or equal maximum over the, these expressions plus this. And uh, so then we, we are here and now we call this CK and look at the structure of these random uh, um, functions CK and uh, 
So it was phi n minus phi. If I write this out, it has this form. And then this was an average over j, a gradient of j's. And this was an expectation. So we have this structure. Therefore, this here, which we abbreviated CK, is a mean over WIK's. And these are uh, zero mean random variables. OK, now. Uh, and this now summarizes uh, the properties we have of our WIK and our CK here uh, in a more general setting. Um, so I don't uh, repeat this. What we also need is that these WIKs, these gradient differences, are, uh, have, uh, satisfy a Gaussian tail uh, bound. But uh, we will have that these are uniformly bounded, and then this uh, automatically holds. And now, uh, based on uh, this paper, one then can show the following. The expectation that the maximum over the norms of these CKs is le less or equal epsilon uh, or this expectation is less than or equal epsilon as soon as n satisfies this lower bound. And uh, so this expression was exactly, is this one the only expression that we still have to estimate? And uh, we also can have uh, high probability bounds on this maximum here. Uh, the probability that it exceeds epsilon is less than or equal delta whenever n satisfies this bound. The important thing here is the size of, so the capital K will be the size of our cover, covering, which can be big, of course, and this capital K only appears logarithmically. So this is important, clearly. And here, uh, also, this probability here of, say, failure of a good, uh, of, of this being small, we want to have delta very small, but it also only appears uh, logarithmically. So we can easily achieve very high probability of, of this uh, uh, estimate uh, to, to hold. Um, and this 1 over epsilon squared, this is what one would expect. It corresponds to the 1 over square root n estimates one usually has in Monte Carlo approximations of expectations. Uh, but here we have a max and not just one, one uh, uh, mean of random variables. OK, now what remains is the capital K was uh, the uh, uh, the size of the covering, and we need upper bounds in our case on this cap, uh, capital K. Uh, now there's the concept of uh, covering numbers. So given some, uh, say, grid size of a covering uh, for a set x0, the covering number is the minimal number of closed balls of this radius nu that are necessary to cover the set x0 and the balls are taken with respect to the norm in the space x. In our case, x0 will be uh, the, the h1 bounded set in which our v n bars live, and the uh, space x will be L2. And uh, now there's a result, uh, in, for instance, in this paper, that the closed unit ball in h1, viewed as a subset of L2, has a covering number that is upper bounded by this expression. And now we can use now this to get uh, how, how big capital K will ma maximally uh, become in our situation. OK, and now if one uh, puts all this together, then we can show the following. We again express stationarity by means of an, the normal map. Now. If n is sufficiently big in this sense, and if now, so this is the number of samples in our sample average approximation, and we have a first order stationary point of our SAA problem, then in ex the expectation uh, uh, over the um, 
stationarity with respect to the original problem is less than or equal epsilon, given that n satisfies this bound. This part here comes from the covering number estimate. Okay, and this here is, uh, in our derivation, we needed a Lipschitz constant of the normal maps, but we can deduce it from a Lipschitz constant of the gradients uh, of the data-dependent part of the cost function. Okay, and uh, tau is the sub-Gaussianity parameter. Um, so this was a result in expectation. Um, yeah, maybe I skip these uh, remarks. And uh, we also have uh, um, remarks on uh, with high, uh, the results with high probability. If the sample size is sufficiently big in this sense, then uh, we can show that the probability that any uh, stationary point of the SAA problem is uh, epsilon uh, stationary for the original problem, so that the probability of this is at least uh, uh, one minus delta. And the delta appears only uh, logarithmically here. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, so th this then uh, allows us to, to have such results with very high probability. By the way, these results often asymptotic results require that n is sufficiently big and then they hold or they have hidden constants these estimates, so we can quantify all constants and they hold for all sample sizes. Okay, and, and now if one prefers uh, uh, the uh, usual criticality measure over the normal map residual, uh, we also can translate our results to this. This is actually not uh, difficult. And for instance, for the expectation result with the same n as we had in the normal map setting, we can show this bound. Now, the alpha was the regularization parameter. Um, the reason why we have here epsilon over alpha can be motivated as follows. If we would not have this non-smooth part, uh, this non-smooth regularizer, if it would be zero, then the prox would become identity, so it would disappear. Then the, uh, our criticality measure would look like this. And this is just the norm of 1 over alpha times the gradient of the objective function. So the scaling here is such that we have 1 over alpha times the gradient and not the gradient. And this is reflected in this epsilon divided by alpha. Okay, how much time is left? Okay, thank you. Um, now, we can all uh, verify all uh, assumptions that we needed to derive our uh, sample size estimates for uh, a PDE's, uh, PDE constraints of this form. So this is uh, a linear elliptic second order operator like minus Laplace, uh, but uh, with coefficients that can depend on uh, random parameters. Uh, so the, the space setting then is the spa uh, state lives in H10 and maps uh, and the, this operator maps to the dual space. We had this already in uh, Michael's talk. Um, then this is a nonlinearity. Um, and here uh, this is the right hand side where also randomness can enter. And here we have a, a bounded linear operator where also randomness can enter. Uh, uh, that is applied to the control. So control is acting via this uh, bounded linear operator. In our case, we could be more general, but in our case, uh, the control operator is just multiplication by a function. P of psi times u uh, is what this P of psi times u means. Um, now, the, uh, we assume that this operator is uh, a strongly elliptic, uniformly in psi, or strongly monotone. Um, and now the Q is, a, as usual in semilinear PDEs, it is a superposition operator. 
y is a function, the state that lives on the domain d, and the q just consists in uh, inserting this function into an outer function q, so composition of functions. And we again get a function, and this is the output of this operator. Now, if q is uh, non-decreasing uh, and satisfies certain growth bounds and is twice continuously differentiable, then one can show that this operator is monotone and it is a, a C2, twice continuously differentiable. And then uh, it, overall one then has a strongly monotone operator here and this gives us unique solutions. Okay, and we need uh, in this B, we, uh, this, this G needs some regularity. We want that, uh, well, this maps again to a sufficiently nice space. Um, okay, and, and now for, for this setting, we, uh, uh, we can uh, verify all our assumptions and there would be generalizations possible. Uh, now, finally, some experiments. Uh, we want to, we had estimates on this quantity, how it behaves in dependence on uh, sample size, uh, regularization parameter, etc. Now we did some experiments to, to uh, validate this. Um, uh, there are now some obstacles. In this criticality measure, we have this uh, capital F, and capital F includes an expectation. Now, uh, of course, if we want to evaluate this numerically, then we again have to approximate the expectation. We do this by a brute force sample average approximation with more samples than capital N. Uh, then also, uh, this, uh, our problem, even after SAA approximation, still in space is in function spaces, and the PDE is present, we have to discretize this. We do this by finite elements, and uh, whenever we have an, a subscript, n, a small n, this means is a measure for the fineness of, or a grid size of the, um, of the finite elements. Um, we use Phoenix, Dolphin adjoint for derivative computation, use the same as smooth Newton's method to, uh, to compute solutions. The computations were done by, by Johannes Mills. Um, yeah, maybe I skip over here. So um, this shows us independence of the sample size. Um, so this is our numerical approximation of uh, the expectation of the criticality measure. This means we do finite element discretization. This means we do brute force uh, approximation of the expectation appearing in our criticality measure. Uh, now, each such dot for the different uh, sample sizes gives us one run for a different sample, and then we solve the SAA problem. Yeah. Uh, and here, then you see, uh, we get some, uh, for, for, uh, if we compute this average, we get these big dots, and we get some rate approximately a bit worse than 1 over square root n, uh, which is a bit better than our uh, estimate. But in our estimate, certainly we will do we overestimate uh, via uh, we have a quite big set for which we need a covering number, and maybe one can do some improvements there by bootstrapping or, or other techniques. Okay, but uh, time is over. Then I, I conclude. Um, I showed you in an infinite dimensional setting uh, sample size estimates. Uh, uh, we, there, uh, this also is important if you have high dimensional problems, then if you can do it for infinite dimensions, then you, you have some uh, dimension independence, mesh independence. Uh, and what we used was we, we used normal map and uh, to, to uh, see that the SAA solutions are in a compact subset and then we were in business to do uh, usual techniques. Thank you very much.